Okay, so welcome to week two. We survived the first week. Yay, we haven't gone into lockdown. Woohoo! Uh, let's see. So today we are going to start talking about the how do you develop an idea, whether we're talking about a movie, an animation series, an animation, a game. How do you develop something that people are interested in viewing, in playing, in buying? Because it would be good to actually have something that is marketable, something that we can sell to other people and be able to go buy a pizza. That, that's always a real nice thing that, that can occur when we're trying to do something like this. So, Today, we're going to start looking at what's involved in creating something that is marketable. How to look at the various demographics and, and make sure that it is um, viable for what you want to do. So one of the first pieces of research in this subject area was done by R. Bartle back in 1996, which in the, this field makes it old. I mean, it was before most of you were born, so yeah, that, that makes it old, right? Um, the, the, the history of game development, you know, we really goes back into the 60s, and it actually goes even a little further back than that. But the research into what motivates people to play different styles or different kinds of games was begun by R. Bartle. Back in 96, he looked at MUDs. Does anybody know what a MUD is? You've probably heard the term, but you may not be sure of what it is. No, no clue. Any, anybody from Zoom? Nobody has any idea what a MUD is. I feel so old. So a MUD had existed for a long time on university mainframes before the internet. I was playing on MUDs back when I was in college in the 80s. MUDs are multi-user dungeons. And they're, they're set up to run on a mainframe. You've got multiple people running around in text-based rooms. So you run into a goblin and you type in attack goblin with sword. It was so much fun. Because primarily it's all up here, just like traditional Dungeons and Dragons, you know. It, it's all in your mind. You, you might have some dice, you might have some sheets of paper, but you're imagining the scene. Well, that's what MUDs were. You mm. would imagine the scenes, but you might have a hundred people running around in the same virtual room that's text-based and you could chat with them you could work together to attack something uh, to explore an area and what they found in the research based upon these muds was that there were four basic types of players inside of a mud and this has held true as we became more digital world of warcraft um, eve uh, you, you know, uh, all the, e even into the uh, Battle Royale games, uh, Fortnite and some of the, the more current games. There are four basic types of players that get into these types of games. The hearts, the clubs, the diamonds, and the spades. So he, he obviously named them after suits of cards. And each one has a different type of playing inside of these games. So according to Bartle, the first type is the hearts. These are the people that are get online to socialize. Anybody do this during COVID lockdown? No, I was the only one. Okay. So they get online to interact with other people. My daughter falls into this category. She was huge in, oh, what was it? RuneScape. My parents she, don't even play that because it's evil. It has magic. <laughs> <laughs> it has magic. It must be evil. 
Uh, no, no. I, I heard the same thing about Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s. Oh, you're all a bunch of Satan worshipers. No, 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 we're not. We're killing the demons, not worshiping the demons. It's, it's completely opposite, but no. So yeah, she was huge on Rune. At one point, she got like the top 100 players of RuneScape. Um, she went online for RuneScape for socialization. She would jump in, she would play, she, she learned so much about how people behave. And she encountered all the different suits that Bartle talks about and told me about it as a young teenage girl that was playing RuneScape. But she would get in and socialize and everybody knew who she was, you know. She was, oh, go talk to her. She'll help you figure out how to get through that dungeon or she'll go through it with you and, and help you. So she was a socializer. She got on the game to socialize with other people. And you, we still see that today. You go into World of Warcraft and you see this huge congregation in the cities and people are chatting and jumping up and down and off of buildings and dancing and, and doing all kinds of things. They go online to socialize. They're chatting with other people. And that's why they're online. A critical group, because the socializers tend to be a very large group in multiplayer games. And, and of course, we are referring to specifically multiplayer games when we're talking about these suits, because it's hard to socialize if you're in playing solitaire. It kind of goes against the whole concept, right? If I'm playing a single player game, it's because I don't want to socialize, not because I do want to socialize. So yeah, the, the hearts or the socializers are a critical, very large component of playing these types of games. Then we have the clubs. The clubs are the killers. They are the ones that go on to these games to mess with other players. Also, we might refer to them as trolls inside the games. My daughter's first encounter, one of her first encounters with somebody else online was with a club or a killer. The person says, hey, you've got really awesome character. Could I play him for a little bit? What's your password? And being the young, naive person that she was, she gave them her password. And then she went to log back in a little bit later and her character had nothing. No gold, no armor, nothing. They had emptied her online bank account. They had stolen, they manipulated her into giving the information and they stole everything that she had. So the, the clubs, the killers are like, yeah, my computer's messing up. What do I do? How do I get beyond this? Oh, all that for. Some of you, you know, I don't get to see your facial reactions right now. You got to be a little more demonstrative as, as, as what happens when you hit all that four on a Windows machine. It closes out the game, right? It, it, the active window is closed. So, yeah, that it's you manipulate other players. It's like, yeah, why don't you charge into that um, room over there and you lead the attack. You can be the tank and we'll follow behind you. So they, you know, they do all the Argo and, every, and then everybody else comes in and does whatever they want to do as the person that went in first is dead. So the clubs are the manipulators. They, they are there just to see what they can get other people to do. Uh, diamonds are the achievers. They are there to interact with the environment. They, they're the ones with every single achievement is, that is possible within the game. You know, the, I, I remember once I got the achievement playing World of Warcraft, um, jump from a, a thousand feet and survive. It's a thing. You, 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 obviously you cast a slow fall spell halfway down so that you don't die, but it's, it, 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 it's a challenge, it's an achievement. What can I do? It's an exploration of the environment. 
And then the final group is the spades. They are there to manipulate the environment. They are playing against the game developers. The diamonds are playing against other players. They want to be number one on the leaderboard. The spades are there to play against the developers. What Easter eggs did you hide in here? What is happening inside this environment? What can I do inside the game? What can I make it do that you didn't intend for it to do? Now, these four groups interact with each other, obviously, because it's a social environment. What they have found in the research that if you don't have at least some killers in the game, the socializers don't have anything to talk about. They have to have the socializer to talk about what it is that they're doing or they don't get, I mean, they, they have to have the, the person that's manipulating, did you see what they did? It was horrible. Now, one of the most famous scenes of hearts versus clubs was a few years ago in World of Warcraft, one of um, a, a person died in real life. And so they held a memorial inside of World of Warcraft. Now it was in a contested area and a group of killers from a rival clan charged in with weapons and attacked those that were there to eulogize the, their friend that had died in real life. And it was a massacre, you know, it was, it was, it was bad, but it created a social buzz. The socializers were talking about it. If you don't have people out there creating conflict, the socializers get bored and go someplace else. Now you can't have too many killers. You can't have too many clubs. And, and really, I don't like the term killer, especially in, in the, today's uh, social environment that I wish we had a better term for that. But you can't have too many clubs inside of a game environment or it'll overbalance it and the hearts will go someplace else. They'll leave the game environment for something that's less toxic. And you hear that discussed a lot about online game environments, the toxicity of the environment. You get too many clubs in there and it becomes too toxic. They're all focused on manipulating each other and the, the people that are nice and good and just there to have fun leave. So it is critical that we, we find a way to control and make sure that the clubs don't get out of hand. You can't have a, a ratio above a certain point of clubs to other suits before you start having problems. And so that's why online, um, it, you'll even see job postings for this, online community managers to try and keep the toxicity level at the right level so that the everybody has things to talk about and socialize about, but they don't, it doesn't become a toxic environment. So, and there's all kinds of things that we could discuss about that. Um, there was the Gamergate a couple of years ago. There's, we, we still have some repercussions of um, women who are gamers that go online and are twitching or streaming theirs and they, they face a lot of backlash. Oh, you're not a real gamer. It's like, really, dude, you, you don't have a date. So knock it off. Um, it, it's, toxic and, and it's not a good thing. So we need to find a way to try and correct that as a social issue. Um, and, and I think that is a responsibility of game designers, game developers to try and face that issue. So, which brings us to what motivates people to play a game, whether single player or multiplayer. What are your motivations? But uh, I'm asking, why do you play? Well, yeah, it, does, it, it does vary from game to game. I'm not a big fan of dying inside. 
<laughs> the addiction thing is definitely there. Yeah, it's, I, I spent another hour last night playing Skyrim again. I think I logged like 400 hours over the summer. It was COVID, you know, you couldn't go out. So, uh, I was Dragonborn. It's, it was cool. Uh, what else? What are your motivations for playing a game? Challenge. The challenge of it. Now, my challenge, is it a exploration, get all the achievements, or is it a, I wonder what the developer did there? Like a, like a game difficulty. So you're, you're playing against the game, not necessarily against the developers. Yeah. You want to see what, what, what can I do in the game? You're exploring. Yeah. What else? Or who else? Nobody else in here plays games. The storyline. The story that is a huge motivation. What's the story of the game? Or the story of the movie? Or the story of the animation? I mean, are you watching Avatar The Last Airbender because of the fantastic animation? Did you watch Pokemon because... Pikachu's cute, or was it for the story? There's no opinion. Come on, give me some feedback here, people. Why do you watch the shows that you watch? The story. And, and you want to see what's going to happen next. And occasionally you get something really original and they surprise you. And sometimes it's even a pleasant surprise. Wow, look at what they did there. Um, I think I mentioned in class last week, I started watching uh, The New Adventures of Monkey, which is based on the Monkey King stories. It's out of Australia and it's on Netflix. Season two dropped over the summer. It was very enjoyable because I wasn't as familiar with the Monkey King story. And it was the new adventures of the Monkey King. It wasn't those old stories. It was new stories. And there, while there are some fun tropes of groups going through, you can tell the writers had fun writing it, but they understood what the audience was looking for. And so it was an entertaining half hour show to watch in the evening, which occasionally I would even laugh out loud as I was watching it. So it was enjoyable. So what are the reasons why people play games, go to the movies, go to, um, you know, land parties? Why do we do these different things? Sometimes it's, for the social interaction. Do you go, always puzzled me, I'm guilty of it as well, but we go to the movies with our friends to sit in a, star, a dark room and be quiet. Right? We paid 20 bucks by the time we got popcorn and, and a soda and, and all that to go watch a, a movie, which, you know, there, there's the entertainment value in it but we go with a group of friends and sit there and be quiet. We take a date to the movies to sit there and be quiet. Okay, maybe not. Just, you know, kissing in the back row, stuff like that. But it's it, generally our interaction with those environments, the social interaction of going to the movies is we're experiencing it together. You know, the, the whole... Um, Sunday afternoon football on a regular year where we everybody gets together to watch the game. Oh, did you see that? Yes, I'm sitting right here watching the same TV as you are. Yes, I saw the same thing that you just saw, but you can't say that, right? Because that would be socially inappropriate. At least that's what I've been told. Never mind. Uh, we won't talk about my, my so, in, inappropriate social interactions. Um, so sometimes it's because we are physically secluded 
Perfect example is what we've just all been through, the whole COVID issues, the pandemic issues. We're socially isolated, so we might get online or Zoom chat or watch a movie together while we talk to each other over the phone or some kind of a chat program. We're to do it together, to interact together. One of the, one, during the Gulf War, one of the biggest things that they did what, for the soldiers that were over there and for their families that back, were back in the States was that they set up a bunch of Facebook style games, you know, casual games that you could play with one another and be able to chat because you can only ask, are you safe? Are you okay? What's happening so many times? And it's like, leave me alone. I'm, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I already told you that. Instead, they put up checkers or chess or just playing some casual games so that you could still have the social interaction through the internet, even though you're half a world away, and feel like you were together. I got to spend time with someone that was important to me that was in a different location. So that social interaction, even one-on-one -on -one is critical, that is provided through these. That is one of the, the, and the dealing with physical seclusion is the other side of that. We're away from family, we're away from people that we care about. And so we do something that allows us to have that, um, to break that physical seclusion and feel like we're with a group of people. It helps break that down. This is one of, the, the big things that they're really pushing for with virtual reality. Virtual reality allows us to have social interaction, plus we get the feeling of immersion. We're there inside the environment and we feel like we're there, even though, you know, I know this is pixels, I know this is just an environment that I'm interacting with, but it feels real. I'll if I see a virtual table in front of me, I walk around it instead of through it. I could walk through it and thus suffer no physical harm, but because it's of the immersion of virtual reality, I believe the table's there. Now the research is still out on there on this, but it's beginning to look like the virtual reality immersion does make people feel like they are really there. Um, I attended a conference over the, the summer that was done in virtual reality and was a bunch of, you know, people that teach, educators that were looking at how can we do a better job of doing virtual immersion through using virtual reality. Now it was a weird environment. You could walk through another person and that really kind of freaked you out. It's like, ah, they're walking towards me. They walked through me. You know, this, this is not just a ghost thing. This, this is the VR characters walking through each other. They ha there was no collision between them, which I can see that, you know, as, as a designer, think about that. If I put, uh, oh, I didn't see over there. I got the screen in the way. <laughs> there we go. No. Can see it. <laughs> um, the the um, we we've got the immersion factor happening inside of the virtual reality, and we don't want to have collision on the characters because back to our killers. What happens if they block a person in? They could physically, with collision, block a person, get around a person, and block them in, and that could be very intimidating. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure that would be very intimidating. So it's very critical that we build these virtual environments, these immersive environments to be as friendly as possible, to not freak people out by being able to walk through them, but we also can't have the collision that forces somebody into a corner and they can't get out of it. That, that's very intimidating. So uh, go, getting going, but I, I went off track there. That won't be the first time I do it this semester, but we, we need to look at what's the motivation for why people are playing. So some people play for social interaction. Some people do it to relieve physical seclusion. 
Others do it because they're competitive. I want to be the number one on the leaderboard. My clan needs to be number one. Or, hey, my character now uh, has a million points, which is so much better than the 500,000 points that I had last week. And now I can go do these new adventures or, or take on new things or I get a new weapon for, for whatever the challenge is. So competition can be a huge motivating factor on why we continue to play. Um, and, you know, what's, why do we replay? Why do we rewatch a movie? Why do we replay the same game over and over again? Usually, part of that is competition. Anybody here into competitive gaming? A few people. Why do you do that? It's fun. It's competitive. I like it. I'm number one. Or number two, maybe. You know, you're, you're, I'm good at this. And I enjoy doing it. So the competition is definitely a factor. Esports has become a huge thing. Who would have thought people would sit around and watch other people play games? But it's becoming a huge, and especially now that we don't have traditional sports, people are dying to watch, sometimes literally, to watch any kind of entertainment that they can go out and see. So eSports is a nice way, oh, well, we can just load up Twitch and we can watch Competitive gaming happening right in front of us, and it's a great thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a representative from Amazon Web Services Game Studios visit us on campus, and he gave me this huge, like, 10-page document that they go through, and it's kind of a checklist on how to make a game a good esports game. Some of the things that you need to include in the game to make it a great environment. Um, sometimes it's for knowledge. What's our reason for exploring it? I, I want to be the expert, you know, get on the forums and answer other people's questions. It's like, well, if you combine this thing and this thing and then jump off this building, this happens. How did you find that out? A lot of hours of playing. It's, it's, so we, we get into the whole knowledge basis system. There's also the mastery. I want to master the game. You, you throw an obstacle at me, I can deal with it. I can handle that. And I've mastered that game. Um, sometimes it's escapism. I just, I've had a long stressful week or a long stressful day. I want to go play my game and just escape for a little bit. It is um, to lower your blood pressure, to, to center you again so that you can deal with the next day. And, and that's, you know, what a great time we live in that we can just go fight pixels and, and relieve our blood pressure and take out of our aggression. And we can then go to, you know, I, while members of Congress may disagree with us, we know that gaming does not lead to violence. Statistically, there is no connection between it. It's, it that's, you know, that is just a political thing that they use to rile up old people who don't play games to get them to vote for them. It's idiocy. And actually I'm part of a, um, a group that fights that idiocy and provides information to Congress members that you know gaming is not a source of violence that that is not the source um sometimes we our motivation is addiction i'm i just i'm addicted to this game and it it is my go-to for whatever reason for usually it's a relaxation type thing addiction it's like no it lowers my blood pressure it makes me feel better and there is a little bit of addiction. Though we also have the addiction problem of online gaming, of online gambling. That can be a huge, huge issue for a lot of people. If you've got gambling issues, 
online gambling places are doing great. Las Vegas is not doing great during the pandemic, but online gambling, poker players, casinos, all kinds of games of chance, they're thriving throughout this entire thing. So there is a, a problem with addiction being uh, part of the motivation. Sometimes it's creative expression. How many people play Minecraft for? How many people play Minecraft? Okay, the majority of the class. I assume our Zoom people are saying the same thing. That Minecraft is a creative expression. Otherwise, why would you spend six months replicating the Starship Enterprise in Minecraft? Or building a computer? Really? Yes, they, they built computers in Minecraft. It was a huge thing, but they built a computer, which that's, you know, pretty cool that, you know, they, they, they had the system in there that it, it would work that way. Gaming or mo your motivation might also be therapeutic. There are a number of uh, psychiatrists, counselors, psychologists using game design or using virtual reality to help people deal with phobias, to help them deal with a therapy issue that they are dealing with. Let's say you have agoraphobia, the fear of going outside, being in large open spaces. Well, if you're stuck in your house, how can we help somebody work through that? You don't want to just take them out in the middle of Kansas and dump them. They've got a phobia. That would be mean. Instead, we can have them put on virtual reality and go experience that. If you're deathly afraid of flying, well, we can take you and walk you into a plane in virtual reality and you're still safe in your environment. And if it's too much, you just take the goggles off. Fantastic therapeutic use of the technology. And it really has helped a lot of people deal with these types of issues. Now, as I'm going through the material in this class, I'm going to do the best that I can to present everything from a global perspective. I think we, as Americans, frequently make the mistake of looking at our own navels too much. We are not, you know, what, there, there's 372 million people in the United States, give or take a few hundred thousand. Not all of them play games, but worldwide we're approaching 8.2 billion. Now, if I'm making entertainment, whether that's, again, and, and I, I know I've spoke, a, a lot from the gaming perspective, but this also applies to film creation and that type of entertainment as well, animation, TV, etc. If I'm creating entertainment, do I want to target 372 million people or 8.2 billion people? This isn't real hard math. I want the largest audience that I can pull into my entertainment that I'm creating as possible. I want to involve as many people as possible so that they are willing to, to play this. So globally, if we look at this, we, we have to be aware of what's the most popular in different regions of the world. For instance, South Korea is the most connected country in, actually, I think that's now Norway. I, I was just checking on that and I'm pretty, well, no, they're, they're the most Wi-Fi connected. South Korea is the most wired into the homes and things like that. Japan likes handheld devices. So the switch is the most popular, and, and before that it was uh, personal digital assistance type devices. They are the most popular with the smaller handheld type devices, and they are the first to use that. Germany is the second largest marketing for game design after the United States, specifically for the PC. 
And then there are regional differences inside the United States. If I'm targeted as a, a game in the South, some types of games are going to be more popular in the South than they are the Northeast or the Northwest. There's just, you know, if, if I'm making Deer Hunter, where do you expect that game to be the most popular? There's some games that are just simply going to be more regionally popular than others. We do continue to have the problem of player kills or player swatting, where you somebody beats you in an online game, and so you call the police on them, or in some cases, drive halfway across the country to shoot them. And this happened just over the summer here in the United States. Someone drove from California California to Texas and shot an opposing player. It's like, really? Really? You need to turn your computer off. It, it, get back into real life. This, this is not the way you do that. Who drives for two days because they're upset about this other person killing them in a game? That is not the actions of a, a healthy individual. So we, we are continuing to have those problems. Again, that requires some community monitoring inside the game environment because people that are involved in that do like to sue the, the game companies that made it because they have deep pockets or presumably have deep pockets. We also frequently run into the challenges from many countries of depiction of violence is, runs into legal issues. So again, you need to be aware of what the laws are, what the legal requirements are for whatever region or your target audience is for the game that you're creating. Censorship in general, getting into China, you have to censor your game somewhere. Yes, like yes. And e every regional or country has its own requirements. In Germany, you are not allowed to depict the killing of people. So all the first person shooters switch out the people for robots. So it, it just is based entirely upon what different laws have been enacted in those countries. Okay, so as I said, most wired countries, Norway still leads the most wired countries in the world. Um, United States, as you can see, is way down here in the bottom left quadrant, um, primarily because of rural areas. We have a lack of internet connectivity in more rural areas, including the city that we're in, does not have nearly the connectivity that you would find in other larger cities. Uh, matter of fact, I had better internet connection in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri than I do in Abilene, Texas. And that's just pathetic. I mean, the population difference between here and there, I, I was in a town of 3,000 in Missouri, and here we've got 150,000. But no, we, we've got cruddy internet here in Abilene. Um, I'm, I'm just glad that the campus has fairly decent internet. Yes? Is it possible it's because of the population difference? Uh, no, not when we have other large cities that do have really good internet. I mean, odds are if you're from Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, Houston, you probably had much better internet than what we have here. So, no? No. No? I love that area. No. Okay. It seems to be horrible. Well, yeah. Well, well since, we, since, since I'm recording this, I'm not going to name any companies. <laughs> but yes, there, there's a certain company that starts with the letter A and, and provides telecommunication services that has not adequately taken care of its customers. Yet. And I've told them that on every survey that I get from them. Strangely, I've stopped receiving surveys from them. Um, so yes, we, we need to look at the, you know, the, the, um, the Nordic countries are doing a great job of connectivity for their people into the internet. Now, again, as was mentioned, their population is a little bit lower, but they've done a great job of really wiring in or connecting the people of those countries to the rest. 
of the world. Um, other countries that are more geographically diverse, like the United States or Australia, struggle with having good internet connectivity throughout the entire country. So that can be a real, real problem. Now, as you are developing your concept of entertainment, whether that's an animation, a movie, a game, whatever, a, a TV series, you need to think about who is my target audience? Who do I want this to appeal to? There's a variety of different ways that we can do this. We can use a vowels survey, which is values, attitudes, and lifestyle survey, where we look at who's our target demographic. Who do we want this appeal to? And, and sometimes you'll see this on uh, discussed in uh, shows, TV shows that are about TV shows or making TV shows. They'll talk about, well, the demographics of our 18 to 24 year olds, we're doing fantastic. Um, but we're, we're really losing the audience that's over 65 or, you know, who are, who's the target group for this show? The Simpsons is not targeting over 65. They're targeting a much younger demographic. They're interested in doing that. So you can look at what is the, the vowels system that we use for, um, to, to get an idea of creating the, the story and creating the characters of the story that has the largest appeal possible. Now, we can start breaking these different personality types down. I, I find one of the most fascinating groups, the Bobos, or at least they are referred to as the Bobos. These are the bourgeoisie bohemians. Usually, the, you can spot a bourgeoisie bohemian fairly easily. This is the person driving the soccer van with a sticker on the back of it, or, or soccer SUV. You know, you got all the soccer kids in the back of the, the vehicle. And they are, they have a sticker on the back of it, save the whales or save the dolphin, save the trees, something like that. So they're environmentally conscious. They care about the environment. They care about the world, at least enough to put a boat sticker on, but not to write, stop driving a gas guzzling SUV that gets 10 miles to the gallon. This is an interesting personality type, but is very representative of a target demographic that many, at least television shows, go after. That they want that group because they have money to spend, which means advertisers will pay to be on that show. And that becomes a very important part of figuring that out. Now, another indicator that I really like to use is the Myers-Briggs. The Myers-Briggs type indicator breaks the population down into 16 subgroups and then a wider classification of four subgroups comprised of four each. So the Myers-Briggs includes extroverted versus introverted, which that's where's your source of energy. An extrovert gets excited and pumped up to go out and be with friends. Whereas an introvert, if you surround them with a bunch of people, it wears them out. It's like, I am so tired after 30 minutes. Can we go home now? An introvert gets their energy from quiet, peaceful environment or just sitting at their computer doing stuff. Something to note, most people in the School of IT and Computing fall into the inverted Okay. Probably not a big surprise to most of you, but it, over here, yeah. Whereas we go into COBA where you've got management and marketing, they tend to be more on the extroverted side and not understand why we don't want to gather in large groups. It's like, no, that, that's not a thing for us. That, that's not important. Now, on the, on the flip side, I have to say, you, you have a gaming competition, we show up. Even the introverts will show up. So it's, it is interesting from that. Um, how do we gather data? 
sources of information. You have the sensing versus the intuitive. The intuitive go off more their gut feeling on what's happening internally, whereas the sensing pull in external data to try and figure out how to make decisions. Um, approaches to problem solving, you have the thinking versus the feeling. Now, none, I want to clarify, none of these are right or wrong. You know, you're not bad if you're one or the other. You're not good if you're one or the other. This is just simply a personality concept. And if, while the Myers-Briggs is not widely accepted in the uh, psychology community, it is a great tool that we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. So what is their approach to problem solving? You've got thinking versus feeling. Now I'm married to a feeler. I'm thinking. My wife is very quick to go, no, I don't feel like that's the right solution. And it's like, well, you know, I've done a thorough analysis of this and I've thought about it for a long time. And then I say, you're right, honey. And I do what she says should be done because I like being married and that's how you stay married for a long time. And I've also found that she's usually more, more often right than I am. So listen to your significant other and pull that into you. And then what is your orientation towards the world? You've got judging versus perceiving. The perceiver takes, again, takes in information, um, doesn't necessarily work to change that environment. They're just simply going with the flow of the environment, whereas judging is much more, no, I will shape the world to my version of it. So you get some really interesting combinations as you go through the Myers-Briggs. For example, an INTJ is the basis of every James Bond villain ever created. If they, they represent approximately two to 3% of the population and they are referred to as the masterminds. They are more than happy to think back and maybe pet their kitty cat while they're doing it and figure out how to take over the world for the world's own good. I mean, it's not an evil thing. Uh, that, that's not the motivation. They're doing it because the world needs taken over and straightened out. Yeah, it's an organizational thing. It, it's done out of caring, not out of being a jerk. So it, it, it does become a very important part of how we, we jump into this. So we're, we're gonna come back to Myers-Briggs here in a few minutes. Now, and I'm going from a gaming perspective on this, but it does absolutely impact film, animation, and, and um, TV as well. General demographics, when you are looking at the gender differences, and these are broad, very, very broad scope. Do not think for a second that I'm trying to pigeonhole any gender or age group or anything like that. I'm saying that these are the generalities that we have found through research. You may or may not fall into this. And we have found through my own personal research that the age difference of your parents or the environment that you were, you were raised in might dramatically impact where you fall on these different things. So generally speaking, have, have I put enough clarifiers on there that nobody's going to sue me? Okay, so generally speaking, when women go to play games, they play more cooperative or collaborative style of games. They work better as teams. And heaven help you, if you go into a battle royale against a team of women, you will get your hind ends kicked because they are working together to accomplish their goals. Males tend to be more competitive and frequently much more likely to try and go it alone. And I can do it by myself. And then they get their hind ends handed to them by that group of cooperative playing, collaboratively playing women that are wiping the board with everybody else. 
We also have generational differences. We have the silent generation. This is the generation um, currently, uh, I think they fall 75 and older, maybe it's 78 and older. Um, they are, they're the people who fought in World War II. They went to war, they defended, you know, the, the country and, and from the Nazis and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, probably your great grandparents of this age group. So if they're still alive, the, the great grandparents. Interestingly enough, both presidential candidates fall into this category, this age group. They are the silent generation. Too bad they won't be silent. Um, they, I'll have to delete that from the recording later. Shouldn't give political opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, so after the silent generation, now generally the silent generation, you don't see them in gaming very much. If you do, they might play solitaire or poker. They just, they, they don't get into first person shooters. All of this technology stuff came way after, they were starting to retire when computers came along. Okay, so it, it's, the technology, while they use it, they are, it doesn't come natural to them. My grandmother was in this generation and she learned to use a computer for work. She was a real estate agent in the latter half of her life and she was using a 386 computer to print out her real estate documents. And I was so proud of her, you know, she used Windows 3.0. This is pre Windows 95. She used the computer to accomplish what she needed to, but she, they see it more as a tool rather than an entertainment device. And she was sure that the internet was just a fad. What, computers are just a fad. What are you doing? You, you need a good stable job at the factory. So that, that's a typical thing that you will hear from that generation. Again, they, they are your 80 plus year olds out there. Then comes the baby boom generation. This is the 60s uh, love fest group. They were born post World War II during the, the economic boom of the United States. Now, and, and these generations do go across outside the United States, but generally we do kind of refer to them in a uh, United States focus as, as we're looking at them. So the baby boom generation, again, they did not grow up with technology. Uh, mainframe computers were just starting to become a thing when they were going to college. And so and if you knew how to use punch card programming, then maybe you went into computer science. But for the most part, they only use computers because they needed to use computers for work. From a gaming perspective, this is probably your grandparents' age. Gaming perspective, the baby boomers play solitaire, maybe Mahjong. They don't hesitate to get on and use it as a tool again. Maybe they have a website. Maybe they use some of the environments that are out there. But the baby boom generation, and this would be aged approximately, I think, 56 to 75, 76 now. So they are retiring. They have smartphones. They know how to usually use it, but they probably help you if they get, or they probably call you if they're having problems with it. How do I get it to do this? That is the baby boom generation. Now, Gen X, this, this is my generation, we were born between 1965 and 1980. Well, okay, this has 61 to 81. You got to understand when they give years on this, different groups di uh, argue over when the, the birth times were on this. So 61 to 81, some people say 65 to 82. There's approximately 1.44 billion Gen Xers worldwide. 
we came after the baby boomers. So the baby boomers came along and they had to build all these new schools to handle this huge increase in population and education and it was very industrialized. And then Gen X came along and suddenly we don't need all these school buildings. And we, you know, we, we were living in a post baby boom time period. Um, Gen Xers grew up in the 1970s, the, which was a horrible recession, uh, into the 1980s, which we started seeing the collapse of the Soviet empire. We grew up duck and cover under our desks because we might get duped by the Soviets. So it was a very weird time. Gen Xers are, tend to be the lone hero. Now we are technologically savvy. Computers came out while we were in high school or middle school. And for some of the younger ones, even elementary school. We know how to use the technology and we're not afraid of it. We've also seen it from the time period where, wow, look at that graphing calculator. Isn't that cool? And that was the height of the technology to today. We use the technology, we understand the technology, and we've experienced it from the beginning to the present. We've been waiting on VR for 40 years. And it's finally here. Yay, we get to play with it. So that's the Gen Xer. But Gen Xers tend to lean towards the lone hero type characters, the Laura Crofts. The Wolverines. Wolverine came out as a superhero uh, in, in the X-Men when I was in middle school. And it's like, what a great character, yay! Or Spider-Man, the lone character fighting against evil. Then we have the millennials. Now the millennials generally were born between 1982 and 1997. I disagree strongly with that. I say the millennials were born up to 1999 or even 2000, and Professor Tanner agrees with me on this, the millennials have a different approach to things. There's approximately 1.72 billion millennials. There are now more millennials in the world than baby boomers. As of July 1st of this year, there officially became more millennials than baby boomers. So the baby boomers are getting older, starting to pass away, and there are now more millennials. Obviously, there are more millennials than there are Gen Xers. So Gen Xers are like, really? We, we always get the raw end of this deal. So, uh, But the millennials were raised with a teamwork mentality. Power Rangers, Ninja Turtles, they are digital consumers. They've never known a time period when there was not computer systems. They also came of age as they were trying to spread their wings and fly when we had the economic collapse or the Great Recession of 2007, 2008. And so they were significantly economically damaged by this. That was a, a transformational thing for them. For General X, Gen X, a transformational thing, we had actually two transformational experiences for Gen Xers. Uh, the Challenger explosion in 1985, and then Y2K. So that, that was changed how we view the world. Millennials were less impacted by Y2K or 9-11, um, and because they didn't come in of age until the, the late, first decade of 2000s, it was the Great Recession. So as they were trying to launch, the recession happened and they all moved back in with their mothers and fathers and live in the garage or the basement or whatever. They are digitally con uh, competent, but they tend to be more consumption oriented than creation oriented. Generally speaking, there are always exceptions to all of this. Now, Gen Z, y'all, all y'all, to use the proper Texas second person plural. This is you guys. 
approximately 2 billion Generation Z, or 30% of the world population is Generation Z, tend to be mobile device oriented, as I see many of you working, looking as you walked in at your mobile phones as you, you do things. Mo very mobile oriented as a generation. Also, as I've noted, you tend to be very entrepreneurial. How can I make this into a business? Millennials are, I want to go work for. Gen Z tends to be, I want to create a company that does. That's been my observation from that. So generally, Gen Z is more um, outgoing and willing to try things. Now, the big defining thing for Gen Z is happening right now. You're experiencing it. There is some argument over when Gen Z started. As a, again, I say it started in 2000. I noticed a huge shift in students coming into the classes in 20, between 2017 and 2018. And it was a very clear line, at least as far as what I could see in students here, between a millennial generation and a generation Z. So if you were born 2000 or later, you are Gen Z. They are now trying to discuss when does Gen Z stop? Some people said it stopped at 2010. I think they were wrong. Other people argue that no, it was 2016. And other people are saying, no, it's 2020. And everybody born after 2020 is going to be the next generation. So we're not sure yet. That definition will, will take shape probably in the next five or six years. There's a lot of discussion about it. And the, again, these are a lot of generalities and it does shift as you go from country to country on what that means because of different experiences that are happening. So Gen Z is happening now. Now, the next generation, Gen, they don't have a name yet, so they've started mm -hmm. saying Generation Alpha because we, we're already to Z, so we got to start over. So Gen Alpha, horrible name. Hopefully we'll come up with a much better name here in the very near future. We'll soon get to see what's happening with that. Now, I did find this really cool website. Um, as I was preparing for class today, I try to upgrade my slides or update them every year. And so I found this website that went through and looked at some of the difference between the generations. I thought it was very interesting that generally university degrees from the generation X, one in four got a degree, generation Y, one in three got a degree, and Gen Z, half are getting college degrees, which is, you know, I think that's fascinating that, that that's happening. Um, it, the article goes into what are some of the, you know, defining characteristics of the different groups. Baby boomers drove Ford Mustangs. Uh, Gen X, um, Holden Commodores or Ford Tauruses were, were very common for uh, first cars for us. Gen Y it was the Toyota Prius. For your generation, the Tesla Model S is the want to drive car. I don't know if that's true or not. No, not maybe. It's, if I could afford it, sure. Um, they're predicting for Generation Alpha, it'll be autonomous driving cars. So if you own a car, you won't actually drive it. You'll just say, get in. You'll get in and say, I need to go to school or I need to go to the grocery store. And it'll drive you there. Um, iconic toys, the Frisbee. For baby boomers, Generation X, the Rubik's Cube, a BMX bike for the Gen Y, folding scooters for your generation. Is that true? No. Nah. The electric bikes. You know, the 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 lines that we had here a year or so ago. You know, everybody was. Yeah, the scooters. The birds. Yes, that's it. Yeah. So, yeah. no, yeah. 
Hoverboards. Uh, that <laughs> okay, hoverboards then. So they're wrong there. Um, it also talks about music devices and things like that. So I, I thought it was really interesting how, how this portrayed the, the different groups and what that meant. Okay, moving on. So Gen Alpha, this is going to be your kids. When you start having kids, they're going to be the next generation. They're not going to be Gen Zs. Okay, so we start getting into some demographics then from that. So 52% of players report watching less television as a result of playing games. Yes? No, I'm going to spend time playing a game. I'm not going to watch television. So, which is, as far as ABC, CBS, NBC, and, and all the cable channels, they're horrified by this. But yes, that's, that's what's happening. 47% of players are going to the movies less. And which is why they're all struggling, and especially after the pandemic. 41% uh, of players watch movies at home less often because they're playing games. Now, there are still the, the people that would prefer to watch movies over play games. This is only 41%. 54% of U.S. households have purchased or plan to purchase one or more games for their consoles or Steam or something like that. Only one? <laughs> Right. No, I got on Humble Bundle and I got 20 games to try out over the summer. Um, adult women make up a larger percentage of players than boys age 6 to 17. But that's only if you count casual games. Yeah, well, this is a very broad, broad definition. It's an asterisk. It's only if you count casual games. It is generally towards casual games. And the reason why we signify boys age 6 to 17 is because they tend to be the target demographic or age group of most game designers because they tend to be heavy game players. But if you're designing something that's going to make money, make it for women, a casual game that has in-app purchases. Candy Crush made far more money than Call of Duty. I don't know that for sure. I'd need to look that up. But I'm betting <laughs> that, that they made far more money making their game than what the other did. Okay, uh, moving on. Females of all ages now make up 40% of the game playing population. So that stereotype of only guys play games is wrong. While they may be a slight majority, it's only a slight majority, and that is continuing to decrease over time. Men and women over 18 make up 64% of the player population. So while those under 18 are still a significant portion of the population, they are not the dominant portion of the population. The difference is under 18, they don't have a life. They've got time to play games. The rest of us are going to college or working or things like that. So when we play our games, we just don't have as much time to put into it as necessarily an under 18 year old does. Specifically, they, they like to target the 13, 14, 15 year olds because they don't have a car. So they're not out dating and mom and dad are still paying for everything and trying to keep them happy. And if they're in their room, not causing problems, remember the hormonal storm that happens at that age time. They, anything that keeps the kid happy and quiet, they're gonna take advantage of that. And then finally, 44% of people over the age of 50 are gamers. And that number keeps going up because Gen Xers are now over the age of 50. So, and we are gamers, we like to play that. So my question to you is what type of personality are you? And I'll give this assignment every single semester. I want you to go to 16personalities.com and we don't have time to do it in class. This is gonna to need to be done outside of class. I want you to take it twice. One time, take it for yourself. Find out where you fall because you need to know who you are. 
what is your personality type? The biggest problem that I see in writing, in storytelling, and in game design is that when we go to create it, we make all the characters just like we are. And I'm sure you've read stories like this before. It's like, who is this person? They're boring. Everybody's exactly the same in this book. They all have the same personality because the author wrote all the characters from the viewpoint of doing things exactly like they would do it. And that's bad character design. That's bad character development. Don't do that. No, 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 don't do that. Please, let's create good characters. Because if we have good characters that are rich in personality, the stories write themselves. We know what they're going to do. You know, the reason why I like Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing games is because I'm pretending to be somebody else. So one time take it for yourself so you just know who you are. It can be very enlightening. And just in case you're curious, I'm an INTJ. That mastermind James Bond villain that I was talking about before. Yeah, that's that's me. <laughs> ENFP. ENFP. Should have known. <laughs> so um, then I want you to take it a second time for a character that you want to create. How would they answer the questions? Because the cool thing is after you get the take the test, it gives you all this data on how they respond to stress. How do they respond to excitement? How do they handle the situations in their life and deal with those? So do it once for yourself and you do not have to tell me what yours is. That's your own private information. I would like to see you develop a character with a different personality. And that's going to be the next assignment. I'll get it posted to Canvas after class here. But you're to start developing a character that has a different personality than your own. Tell me about that person. How do they respond to things? You can make a drawing of the character using Photoshop. Oh, I'll put the assignment up. You'll see what it, what's detailed in that. So use this tool. My wife and I have been writing a series of books. We, we do it in the evening. It's our retirement plan. Hopefully we'll get them finished before we retire so that we can retire in comfort. But we're writing these characters and we're going, oh, all the characters, as, as we we're developing the book series, we're like, too many of these characters are like the two of us. We need more diversity. There's 16 different personalities according to this test. So we started taking the test for each of the characters in our story to give us more diversity. And we, we put the initials by each character. We've got a, a sheet on the character development that lists what is their Myers-Briggs personality type so that as we're writing that character, we can respond appropriate to the environment that's happening in them. So this is a fantastic tool. It's free to use. Use it. And so you're going to practice using it once for creating this very first character. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop with the slideshow there. Do we have any I questions? Have questions about sidebar settings? Because the on Canvas, there's an assignment for days or sidebar settings. Yeah, I need to change the due date on that assignment to next week. Because Thursday, we're doing the turn-ins for your, um, the, the, the power outage game or entertainment that you're supposed to be creating. So I know it'll be difficult with the Zoom system, but we're going to try, I'm going to keep you in the same groups that you were in, and you're going to play somebody else's game. Now you're going to have to do it through Zoom. I think that could be very advantageous because you're going to see it from a different vantage point than the people that are physically here. But I'm going to want your feedback on those games, and that'll be the big part of that assignment is giving feedback to what other people created for their game. Other questions? No, okay. 
So our first side quest turn in will be a week from Thursday. And as I was answering questions over the weekend about side quests, these are projects that are side projects of yours. They can contribute to your major project that will be due at the end of the semester, the, the boss project. So, you know, if you're making a game and it's um, a first person shooter and you need trees in there, well, I made a tree. You can turn the tree in as a side quest. I made barrels and, and crates. Well, you can turn the barrels and crates in as a side quest. Okay. So those are all count for those projects. If you're a programmer, I made a script for handling the, the character running around and jumping or climbing a tree inside the environment. That would count as a side quest turn in. I wrote a script to handle those situations. Okay. All right, make sure you're also on Discord taking advantage of that. There was wonderful exchanges of information over the weekend. People were sharing ideas on how to accomplish different projects. People have already been through the class sharing what they did. So make sure you are taking advantage of that community that we have on Discord. And I'll post that again. I think I've got it on our Canvas site, but I'll make sure after class is over. Okay, we've used up our time. I will see you next week and I'll see you virtually on Thursday. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>